Church, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Exodus. Favor that brings good success. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. From verse number 1 to verse number 10. I will ask all of us to read together so that it can sink into our hearts. I will be reading from English Standard Version and you can read from the version that you're having. So one, two, three, let's go. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dubbed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to Beth at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew's children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Praise the Lord. A very beautiful story in scripture that I love with the whole of my heart. And so we just want to commit it to the Lord. Father, we thank you for Exodus 2, a story of salvation, a story that touches our hearts. Lord, even as we hear your word, we surrender and submit to the blessed Holy Spirit, who is the author of scripture to, to even write these words in our hearts and minds. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and greet them and tell them favor that brings good success. You know, I discovered that you can come to church and you don't even know the face of your neighbor. You know, because you come and sit and you face the front, you don't see the person seated next to you and maybe your destiny is right there. So it's just good to share you know, the words of God with your neighbor and just tell them that they look beautiful and because that is true. They are just fine. They are fine. Moses was a fine child, isn't it? And therefore, everyone who is seated here is a fine child of God. Amen? We are happy to be here and just to hear what the Lord has in store for us. I will not really get into so much of the background, but allow me just to mention, just in case you were not in church on Sunday, that this is a period when the Israelites are in Egypt, as God had, uh, had promised Abraham. He said that my people will be in a foreign land, and they will serve there as slaves, and then I am going to pick them out of there, I'm going to deliver them and take them to a land that flows with milk and honey. Joseph is the leader of these people. He had been sold to the Ishmaelites, and God preserved his life in Egypt. He was meant to die. But I, I told you on Sunday, the seed of the Lord never dies. You kill it, it resurrects, even in a big measure. Right, And so this is Joseph. God had intended for him to be in Egypt so that he can preserve a harvest that can preserve the lives of people. Both Egyptians 
Israelites and any other nation that came there. And so they, they, they enjoyed, uh, you know, just being in Egypt, having Joseph as their leader. They were treated well because of who Joseph was. He was the prime minister. But as soon as he died, there was a whole shift. They became slaves. Can you imagine from royalty to becoming slaves? It was a difficult time for the children of Israel. But I want to tell you that even in the difficult times, God is there. Amen? And the best thing that you need to have is God. That is the treasure that all of us desire to have. So as soon as Joseph died, there arose a king who did not even know Joseph or even what he did. And he oppressed the, the Hebrews, the, the children of Israel. At that time, he made them slaves. He caused them to work heavy. And he gave them, you know, work that was impossible. But, you know, because they are slaves, they still had to do it. So they were oppressed. But we established or we found out that the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. That gives me a lot of hope. It, it makes me feel that my God is amazing. Amen. This book of Exodus uh, carries a period of around 80 years. And God is preparing Moses from the time he's born to the time he's rejected and sent away from Egypt. And so it's a, it's a whole period of 80 years. Um, when you look at the book of Acts, chapter 7, uh, Stephen stands to give a testimony of his faith. And I, I, I told you on Sunday that one of the treasures that we need to have in our lives is the treasure of our history. Amen? Because history will tell you where things began. History will tell you who you are and what the intentions are concerning you. If you don't preserve the history you will lose the vision of that particular thing that you have or that particular place where you are. And so Stephen is one of the biggest examples. He's my favorite in scripture. The, the man that I see who really uh, remembered the word of God. You know, at that time of being stoned, he, he, he got an opportunity and he preached to everybody. He told them where the history of the Israelites comes from. From the time it began to the time Christ has been crucified and even ascended. He carried the whole history of Israel. And so Stephen divides the story of Moses in three phases. The pampering, uh, this, the, to pamper somebody is that time when you treat them so nicely. Moses is born and is treated so nicely. He's kept in the palace. Uh, and, and then the second phase is the preparation. God is preparing him to become the deliverer of Israel. And thirdly is the, the pastoring. God, I mean, Moses becomes the pastor of the Hebrews. He's the same person who was preaching to them and telling them to take care of their brothers. That for me was pastoring. He is the same man in, uh, is it Deuteronomy 33, who stands to pray for the Israelites when God wants to kill them and do away with them. He stands as an intercessor. So Moses is a pastor to the people. There's a man called D.L. Moody who writes a lot. He has been a preacher many, many years past. And he divided, uh, you know, the stages of uh, Moses and uh, the people of Israel. And he says the first 40 years, Moses was trying to become something in Egypt. He tried his best, you know, growing up in the palace, you know, he had a name. I believe he had a name that was given to him by the Egyptians. But, you know, after growing, he said, I do not even want to be a son to these people. I am a Hebrew, and he got out of the palace and went to see his people where they were in Goshen. The next 40 years, God shows Moses that he was nothing. Can you imagine? You're there and God is showing you, uh, even if you have achieved this much, you're just nothing. It is me who makes men. 
It is not just because you are in that position that you are who you are. It is me who is making you. And the last 40 years, God is showing Moses that you can take nothing from this land. So sometimes you can go to a land like Geo was preaching in Gerar, uh, Abraham got out of that land with a lot of treasure. You know, after, after saying the truth that Sarah was his wife, Geo made us to understand that he didn't lie because they were cousins and in that culture, a cousin was as good as your sister and God used that wisdom to establish Abraham. He got out of Gerar with a lot of treasure. Abimelech would not, would not touch him at all and he could not touch anything that Abraham had. And we see the same story, a, a similar story with Isaac. The same, same setting and Isaac gets out of that place rich. But Moses, Moses' case was not the same. By the way, I have come to understand that the word of God is so balanced. Because many times you may want to be like Joseph. Other times you want to be like Abraham. Other times you want to be like Isaac. But other times you must be Moses. <laughs> Where you will get out of the land with nothing. Because after he had grown in that land... He got out of the palace and went to Goshen to see his people after understanding that he's a Hebrew and the Hebrews were living in a different place. And then he found, he found a, an, a, an Egyptian fighting with an Israelite. And he said you, he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the, under the sun, a sand. And then he found two Hebrews fighting. And then they asked him, who made you ruler of us, of us? Do you want to kill us as you killed the Egyptian? And Moses got to know that this story is known. And the next thing that will be done to me is that I will be execute, executed. And he ran away with nothing. He never carried anything from Egypt. And all that was in the providence of God. Hallelujah. He knew that I am the one who is making you. He knew that God knew that he was going to make Moses a rich person, even if he has run away with nothing, afraid for his life. Let me just bring you to a brief introduction of chapter number two. The Bible says, now a man from the house of Levi went and took a wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. The setting of this particular place, I, I, I mean text, is the, uh, actually Moses is the one who wrote the book of Exodus. The first five books of the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, was written by Moses. And so he's writing his own story, writing the story of his parents, says there was a man. <laughs> he doesn't say my father. <laughs> he doesn't say my father was a Levite and my mother was a Levite and therefore I stand a chance to write this scripture. He doesn't come from that point of view. He says there was a man from the house of Levi and he went and took as his wife a Levite woman. He doesn't even tell us the names of the parents, but that was the story. I checked out to find out about this woman and this man. First of all, Levi was the third born of Jacob, the third son of Jacob, and this was the priesthood. Of course, we had the Aaronic priesthood, and the helpers were the Levites. And so, um, so, so here we see um, a man and his wife, and they get married, and the woman conceives and gets a child. Uh, you can take your time later on and look at First Chronicles chapter 6, and you will get to know the story of the Levites at that particular time. Levi, the third son of Jacob, had three children or sons. He had Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the second child, or the second son, who is Kohath, had four sons. 
The name of the first one is Amram. The second one, Isa. And the third one, Hebron. And the fourth one, Uziel. And so, the, the, among the four sons of Kohath is Amram. And Abram, Amram is the father of Moses. Now, do you connect? So, the, the, the Levites are there. And then, Amram and Jochebed, the mother of Moses, did not only have one son. It's quite interesting. They had three children. Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. And somebody would ask me, how come... Aaron was not killed. Let me tell you, as much as God is planning our future, our blessings, the devil is also somewhere. And, you know, he's also, he was an angel. He might be aware that something is about to come up. And so, there is a decree that is given by Pharaoh that every male child of the Hebrew family must be killed. It's because the deliverer is about to come. And so at that particular time the decree is given, Miriam and Aaron had been born already. Okay? And so this is something to stop what God is about to do for the Israelites. But remember that God is a promise keeper. He had said that my people will be in Egypt for a period of 400 years and then I will go and deliver them and take them to the land that flows with milk and honey. And therefore, even if a pharaoh comes on board who does not know Joseph, he cannot change the plan of God concerning the people of God. And so he says, Kill every child who is a male. He gave the instruction to the, to the, to the midwives of, of the Hebrews. And so they never killed. Moses was born at this particular time. But the story is here that when, when Moses was born, the mother looked at him and he saw a fine child. I want to ask you, what do you see when you look at yourself? What do you see when you look at your family? What do you see when you look at your job or even your ministry to, 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 to sound spiritual? Okay? How do you see it? Where are you at in your ministry? Maybe just something you're saying, I'm just beginning. I do not have what it takes. I tell you, you must change your sight and look at things from the perspective of God because everything starts small. But the small grows and becomes big, and it becomes a deliverer. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. So the same decree is given to all the Hebrew women, but there is a special woman here who sees from God's perspective. I'm going ahead of myself, but it's okay. She's called Jochebed. She looks at a child, at, at this child, and says, this one is not going to be killed. This one is a fine child. This one, I will not allow anybody to touch him. And so she took a basket, a papyrus basket, and put Mo Moses right there. The, the, the Hebrew word is teba. And that word is only used twice in scripture. The preservation of Moses, that basket, it's in Hebrew, the Hebrew translation is the ark. So it was an ark that she put Moses in. And that ark was done so well. It was coated with tar. And it was able to float in the river Nile, preserving the life of Moses. The second place it is used is during the construction or building of the ark that Noah built. Same word is used there. And the same ark is the one that preserved the people when the animals and people were dying during Noah's time. God preserved the nation through an ark. And that is what we see in the life of Moses. So God indeed has not given us the spirit of fear. First Timothy. 
A second Timothy 1 7. He has given us the, the spirit of power and of a sound mind. And I want to encourage the church that this is something that God has promised. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. When I look at Jochebed, I see a true definition of a spirit of power and a sound mind. She thought, she looked, and she said, I am not going to be afraid of this Pharaoh. I am going to preserve this child. And she put him in, in a basket and carried Moses by faith and put him in the Nile. And it is a whole story that we are going to look at. It is the providence of God. He, you know, she's looking at Moses through the eyes of God. The Bible says, Hebrews 11, 23, that by faith, when Moses was born, was hidden three months by faith, by faith by his parents, hidden by his parents for three months because they saw, I love the plural form because we may forget about Amram and just look at Jochebed. The Bible says they saw, the parents saw a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. That is faith. That is faith. And so when you are a child of God, and when I say child, I don't demean you. It's just because the Bible calls you a child. I know you are grown-ups, but the Bible, you know, looks at us as children so that we can entirely depend on God like a child depends on the parents. Praise the name of the Lord. And so it is by faith that the family hid Moses for three months and they were not afraid of the king's command. So it, this tells me that the parents of Moses never did this only because of natural parental instincts. It was not just because, you know, I, I, I have given birth to this child. I feel so connected. I believe that this family, Amram and Jochebed, saw through the eyes of God and saw the future of the child and hid the child. They never feared the command of the king. This is faith. And today, faith is very important for each and every one of us. If we are going to enjoy favor that brings good success, we must be men and women of faith. Praise the Lord. God's command supersedes king's command. When God wants to do something, there is no king, there is no law, there is no power that can stop him from doing that. And therefore, our dependency must be on God and God alone. Hallelujah. Favor causes you to be viewed as a different person. I say to the church, you could look at yourself and think you are ugly. But favor looks at you as a very beautiful person. And people look at you as a very beautiful person. And that is who you are. You are not an ordinary person. You are a person that has been favored by God. And so she takes the child to the river. The river that kills becomes the river that preserves life. I tell you there are, there are things that kill but when God is in it, it can preserve life. There are problems that will kill some people, but the same problems will preserve others if you're working with God. So the, the, the woman takes the basket, puts the child there, takes them to the river, and leaves them there. It is faith that can cause you to take your three-month-old baby that you are sure she's, he is good looking to go and put him in the river where the crocodiles are. So the, the river could not drown Moses 
because of the providence of God. And by the way, the word providence of God means that God doesn't just provide, but he is in it. He is working with you in it. Every step of the way, he is working with you. If you go to the river, he doesn't just provide an escape route. He is with you in the river. That is the meaning of providence. And so, faith is when you trust God to have his way. When this woman or this family took the child to the river, they handed him over to God. God, you take care of that child. They were from the Levitical house. They knew God. They knew what God is able to do. Church faith is not desperate words. You can scream. You can say things. But I tell you, faith is not any of those. Faith is standing on the promises of God and holding the promises of God as true to yourself. That is faith. Judging him faithful. My friend told me that you have to judge God faithful in this matter. Because if he has said it, he will definitely do it. Jo I mean, uh, Hebrews 11, 11, Sarah judged God faithful. And that's why she was given a child. Whatever situation, are you in a situation in your life? And as much as you know the promises of God, it doesn't seem to be going away. The situation seems to be life-threatening. You can judge God faithful. And definitely he'll come through for you. Anything in the river dies. But what is in the hand of God who created the river can live. Praise the Lord. Did you hear that one? Anything in the river can die. But anything that is in the hand of God who created the river will live. And that was Moses. Favor gives life during uncertainty. Hallelujah. One day of favor is worth a lifetime of labor. And I'm looking at, you know, as believers, sometimes we get the temptation of trusting the things that we do. I, I was reminded as I was preparing for this sermon, I was reminded about Hannah in scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah was going to Shiloh with her husband, the co-wife, and the children of the co-wife. Every year, to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And the scriptures tell me that Elkanah, her husband, used to give a double offering. But do you know, believers, that double offering did not give Hannah a child? Okay, are we together? Many times we count on the things we do for God, and those things are very good. Please give. Give, continue to give. But I want to tell you that God just favors people. It is not your gift that makes God to, to give you something. It is favor that God gives you, that delivers something to you. The gifts that Hannah was carrying to Shiloh did not give her a child. But one time, she, she stood in the temple behind a pillar, and she prayed until words could not express. The mouth was just moving. She was, you know, connected to heaven. And that is what gave her a child. Many times we go to the prayer centers, we pray for 40 days, and when we come back, we give testimonies. It is because I prayed and fasted 40 days that God had no choice but to give me a child. Do you know how many people have gone to the prayer mountain? 40 days, others 52 days, and they still don't have a child. Do you have an idea? I want to bring you to the understanding that it is the favor of God that gives us what we need and what we ask of him. It is favor. It is not 40 days of prayer. And many times that's the place where Believers begin to judge others. 
You mean you still don't have a job? Go to this prayer center 40 days. Cry to the Lord. I did that and I got a job. I tell you, even Abraham went to Geral and he was given amazing gifts. He became very rich. But Moses goes or is born in Egypt and he comes out with nothing. Let me tell you, there is a race that is marked for every believer. Praise the Lord. Yours comes by fasting and praying for 40 days. Mine comes by just telling the Lord, I know that you own heaven and the earth. And I sit here and it comes. And I'm not saying that you should not pray. But I am saying give God the credit. Give God the credit. If it was the, the, the gifts that Hannah was carrying, then she wouldn't have stood in the temple and say, I am the woman who stood here. And for this child, I asked of God. She would have been saying, I gave a gift. I gave a gift in this temple. And God gave me a child. She didn't say that. Thank you for your gifts. They go a long way into helping the ministry. But I want you to kill your gift. There's something that Bishop Lai taught me some time back. And he said, if you bring a sacrifice to the altar, make sure you kill it. Make sure you kill your gift. Because if your gift is still speaking, it means you didn't kill it. Let me explain. Maybe you're looking at me and you're asking, how do you kill money? Killing money means that when you come with your one million towards the sheepfold in Kakamega, you don't keep on announcing that I gave a million. And that's why the tabernacle is standing the way it is standing. That is a speaking sacrifice. You need to kill it and forget. Kill it so that it keeps quiet. And when you see the tabernacle in Kakamega, you say, look at the glory of God. God has built the church in Kakamega. That is killing your sacrifice. And therefore, this Hannah killed the sacrifice and she never thought about the double offering. She gave it to God and forgot. And when the child came, she said, I am the woman who stood here and asked for this child. And God has answered my prayer. This is the child I am coming to lend to the Lord. Church, let me tell you, as we give our gifts, stop talking about them. Let your million be dead. And let us give glory to God who is building the sheepfold all over Kenya. And we have one coming up in Zambia. The <laughs> We had a preacher here who whispered to our bishop that we can have GCI Zambia. Yes, we are international. And so if you thought that giving towards Kakamega is the biggest thing, we still have to go to Zambia. It will be more expensive. And therefore, we need to bring our gifts as we kill them. And the Lord is going to be glorified. Praise the Lord. So, Favor attracts the supernatural. Pharaoh's daughter goes to the river. She's going to bath there. I was just having a mental picture of the family of our president. Then I'm looking at her, his daughter going to the river to bath. You know, because I'm living in this age. <laughs> but during that time, I don't know whether they had hot shower in the palace. I don't know whether they had towels at that particular time or they wiped themselves with the reeds. I don't know how life looked like. But for some reason, Pharaoh's daughter goes to the river to take a bath. <laughs> the providence of God. You know why she's going to the river at that time? It's because there's somebody who needs to be rescued. Praise the Lord. You know, the river served as a place of cleansing for the Egyptians. It was a ritual at that particular time. You go there and bath 
in the river, the God of that river will reward you with good gifts. That, that, that God was called uh, happy. The God of River Nile is called happy. I think he was happy because Moses has come as a deliverer of his people. Maybe that happy doesn't mean the happy that we know today. But she goes there and as she goes to bath, she sees a basket. And bathing stops at that point. I haven't seen in my scriptures, in my Bible, if she really bathed. She was being sent there on assignment. As soon as she saw Moses, sweat, dirt disappeared. And now she began serving the agenda of God, of rescuing this baby. And the Bible tells me that it is Pharaoh's daughter who saw the basket. She had not gone alone. She had gone with other women. Because if you are a princess, you were given women who can take care of you. And security. And for some reason, the Bible doesn't tell me that they saw. The Bible says she saw. Because she was there on assignment. And then she sent one of the women, go and bring that basket to me. I was looking at scriptures and I was getting amazed. Because from the time Moses is born, we don't see a record of him crying. Otherwise he would have been taken and killed. But he only cried when he saw Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> The providence of God. God working with him. Even that cry was so special. And then, you know, mtoto wa nyoka ni nyoka. So you expect Pharaoh's daughter to be as bad as Pharaoh himself. Kill the child. Why should I have pity on this child? And my father says that this child must be killed. But I want to tell you, that is when divinity connects with humanity. The human part of Pharaoh's daughter, of even being a woman, she felt the labor pains. The cruelty that she had been exposed to by the father ended because of the providence of God. And so when the child cried, this woman felt pity and said, bring, bring the child to me. And he said, oh, this must be one of the Hebrew children. And as, you know, she looked at the child, Moses' sister was standing at a corner. See the family of God, see the providence of God. The family of Moses is favored. Miriam is standing at a corner, wise woman. <laughs> we need wise women. We need wise blooms. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And the woman is standing at a corner and looking at the reaction and the gestures and the behavior of Pharaoh's daughter. And she comes quickly and says, Madam, you are honorable. Can I call one of the Hebrew women to become the nurse of this child? I want to tell you something. Let me speak to our house managers who are here. Probably you're looking at yourself and you're saying, I'm only a house manager. Maids, thank you, Bishop. I, you know, I, I was trying to be courteous. But because Bishop has said, we are talking about maids in our homes. Don't take yourself for granted. I want to give you hope that you could be in that palace for an assignment. You are there for an assignment. You may be a messenger in your place of work. You are there on assignment. You are the person that God is going to use to rescue some destiny child. And so the Egyptians were very proud. Remember I told you on Sunday, they felt that they are the only ones who came directly from God. And therefore, they were looking for serious jobs, not made jobs. 
So there was no way out. Moses was going to get a nurse, a maid who is an Egyptian. You see, do you see the providence of God? And these women who are used to becoming slaves, one of them is called, and she's just not anybody. She is the mother. She is the mother. Miriam says, let me get you a woman. And she goes and calls Jochebed, mom, 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 please come. There is a child that needs to be taken care of. And Jochebed comes, and she's given the child. I was wondering, Bishop, why is it that Pharaoh's daughter didn't carry Jochebed to the palace to take care of the business of the palace? But she told Jochebed, take the child and go with him <laughs> to your camp, to the camp of the... Let me tell you, when you are a child of God, the Lord will not allow you to land in the wrong place. Moses needed, yes, he's in the palace, but he needed to be grounded on the Hebrew scriptures. He needed to be taught the things of God, and he could not be taught by an Egyptian. He needed a woman who is from the Levitical priesthood who understands the word of God to teach him the word of God. And that is the role of Jochebed. I tell you, don't deliver a child to fill the earth. Why, by the way, why are you asking us to pray for you to get a child? For what? So that you can be like other women? You need to change and begin telling God, I want to deliver a deliverer. I want to deliver somebody who will carry the word of God and take it to the nation. I want to deliver an intercessor. Those are the kind of prayers that God answers. Our children are not children. They are destiny carriers. They are going places. They are intercessors. They carry the purposes of God. Hallelujah. And so she brings up the boy in the Bible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, media. Time is up. So when the boy was grown, by the way, media will be preaching again on Sunday, so I can finish my sermon on Sunday. They, they like to tell me time is up all the time. So when the boy became big, she delivered him back to Pharaoh's daughter. Let me tell you, it takes faith. It takes faith for you to carry your child again and give him to, to Pharaoh. And that is the time Moses is taken to the schools and, you know, taught literature and all these things because of God. He became a deliverer. Favor. Favor. And Jochebed and Amran were not afraid of anything. They knew that their child was in the hand of God. Let me tell you, even in the palace, God dwells there. In the river, God dwells there. The psalmist in 139 said, even if I go to hell, you are there. Even if I go to the depths of the deep, you have made your bed in that place. There is no place God is not. In conclusion, media, thank you. Never complain when you are in, in the hand of God. Never complain. Trust God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. I know the thoughts I think towards you to give you hope and a future. Praise the Lord. Ensure that you are in the hand of God. That's the safest place. That is the place you will see salvation. As we rise up on our feet, I want to ask you, is the furnace heated ten times? And you're feeling that you will be burnt to the bones and to the bone marrow. I tell you, the Lord is in that fire. He is the God who goes with us to the furnace 
and to the den of the lions. He is a good God. Do not be afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of a sound mind. You need soundness of mind as a child of God. You need power to operate even in this world that is not our home. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so grateful for the privilege of hearing your word. We thank you because you follow your word to perform it in our lives. Thank you, Father, because the purposes for which you send this word, you shall accomplish in our lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you for everyone that has heard this word. I pray that you continue to minister to them. Continue to use it, my Father, to bring hope and faith and salvation to each and every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name do we pray and believe. Amen. If you are there and you are not saved, at the end of the service, we'll give you an opportunity. Don't go home. Just come and receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. God bless you. Hallelujah.